Welcome back. During the month of June, healthcare professionals recognize Aphasia Awareness Month. Dedicated to advocating for those living with this condition, the National Aphasia Association provides access to research, education, and rehabilitation. Board member of the NAA, Dr. Elizabeth Galetta, now joins me to discuss. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me. I'm happy to be here. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about the condition aphasia and how it affects the lives of people who live with it? Sure. So aphasia is an acquired language disorder and it affects all modalities of language. So by that I mean oral expressive, lang oral expressive language, so talking, auditory comprehension, understanding, reading and writing. It affects all modalities of language and it is caused by various factors. So a non-progressive aphasia is commonly caused by stroke and other brain conditions, whereas a progressive aphasia is another type of aphasia that is called primary progressive aphasia. That is a type of dementia. Now, can you tell me a little bit more about the NAA and the work the organization does? I understand that you're a board member. Yes, the NAA is amazing. Um, the NAA is a nonprofit organization supporting people with aphasia. Um, it started 37 years ago by Martha Taylor Sarno, who was one of the first and leading speech language pathologists in this country to work with people with aphasia in a hospital setting. Uh, she started working with people at NYU Medical Center in 1949 and started the National Aphasia Association that continues today to serve people with aphasia. Um, a primary role of the NAA or part of the mission is awareness. And so here we have Aphasia Awareness Month. Thank you again for inviting me to really help educate our communities about aphasia. Um, it, surprisingly to me as a speech language pathologist that has really worked my whole career with people with aphasia, many people do not know what aphasia is. Um, less than 50% of individuals have heard the word aphasia or can define it. Um, and they are aware of conditions that are less common, such as Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis, um, yet aphasia uh, is unknown to many. So one of the mission, part of the mission is to get the word out like we're doing uh, during especially this month, as well as research supporting people with aphasia and helping people with aphasia live productive lives and then supporting families. A really big part of the NAA is to support individuals and families um, that are living with aphasia. Yes, and I understand the NAA is doing amazing work. I got to read up on it. Oh, I understand there's also like a space for people with aphasia, yes. you know, in the AA. Can you just kind of um, highlight that? Because I think that's pretty amazing. Yes, well, we have um, board members that have aphasia that are inform um, the work that we're doing. We have lots of other um, um, subgroups that are working on different projects. And, and actually there are, um, every week there are groups and um, uh, both groups like community groups where people with aphasia can um, have conversations with other people with aphasia as well as other activities for people with aphasia so we have people with aphasia kind of on the inside working with what is the NAA offers as well as things for people all over the country who have aphasia. Now is there any particular demographic that is most affected by this condition? I know that um, as you mentioned not a lot of people are aware of it um, but I'm curious to know is it affecting any demographics more intensely? So demographic is really um, tied to the underlying cause of aphasia. So I said stroke is a common cause of aphasia. We know that certain individuals or have stroke more commonly. Blacks, Latinx individuals have experienced stroke more commonly than whites, for example. As we age, um, stroke is more common. Also, in terms of demographic, if you look at the country nationally, stroke is more common in the south, so in the southern states. Um, those um, locations are more impacted by stroke. And then, you know, the numbers of the people with aphasia, that the people who've had a stroke who have aphasia are a little bit harder to determine, but we do know that about a third of people that have a stroke also have aphasia. And about two million people in this country are living with aphasia. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that information. I'm curious to know, um, as with many conditions, we often tend to look at, um, is it something that could be inherited or is it something that could you know, possibly run in the family? Do you guys see um, anything similar when it comes to this condition? 
again, we have to look at the underlying cause of aphasia, the medical conditions that cause aphasia, right? So if someone has a history of stroke or heart disease or other health conditions that lead to stroke, then you could maybe tie it that way. Um, certainly, primary progressive aphasia, which is a form of dementia, we know that there are um, genetics are tied to that. So in that sense, yes. But we also know that aphasia does not um, specialized, you know, really um, older people, younger people, and people from um, any group can have a stroke and can have aphasia. Now, can you discuss some of the challenges people with aphasia face regarding work and their communities? I know that NAA aims to address diversity, equity, inclusion, access, and social justice for people living with aphasia. Yes. I mean, think about it, right? Most of our work in this world involves communication, right? So anyone who is um, in a position where they acquire aphasia, it clearly impacts work. I mean, it clearly impacts our communication. And, you know, that is hugely challenging. I have to say that while most people do not really return to work in the same capacity, people do continue to work. So I think it depends on how you look at it, you know, um, depending on what your role is within your work setting. Uh, and then also people sometimes are able to get support. There is a specialty within rehabilitation, vocational rehabilitation, that helps support people with disabilities in a work setting, so there can be accommodations. Um, and both our healthcare um, communities, as well as, of course, the National Aphasia Association, work to help support people to go back to work or to do other things um, similar or different from the things that they were doing prior to their acquiring aphasia. Now, yeah, and I think that's so interesting because, um, you know, this is the first time that I'm learning about it. And as you mentioned, so many people don't know. And I think that sometimes when people don't know things, um, they tend to have maybe misconceptions or ideas about people that may um, may not be correct. You know, have you in this work, have you found that people kind of carry any misconceptions about people living with aphasia? Yes, aphasia is not an intellectual disorder. It is an access problem, so people have their intellect, yet they have difficulty retrieving and accessing their language as they typically had done prior to having aphasia. So I think that is something that uh, the world has a hard time grappling with and understanding. Certainly we've had some um, more high profile individuals that have aphasia that have been um, in the news recently that I think has helped to sort of spread the word about what aphasia is. But I think you having me here and really um, helping us spread the word about aphasia during Aphasia Awareness Month is a really wonderful step. Of course, and I'm so glad to have this discussion with you. Now, I understand that the NAA recognizes intersectionality, which is so um, important and is a very huge thing, especially, um, you know, as today we are becoming just a little bit more aware of all the challenges that, you know, different people face. You know, can you just explain why highlighting how other adversities could impact those with aphasia and basically why that's important? Sure. So, you know, people with aphasia identify as having aphasia, but they identify with lots of other groups as well. And, uh, that, you know, we're multifaceted. People with aphasia are heterogeneous, right? So there's not just one type of person who has aphasia. So we have our other affiliations. And um, <clears throat> so that is certainly relevant, and the NAA really works to support that. Um, there is a, for example, there is a community group supported by the NAA that meets. It's the Black American Aphasia Community Group where people come and talk. They, in a community group, they talk about whatever they'd like to talk about, certainly issues related to their aphasia and, and, and um, very likely issues related to being a black person with aphasia. I ran a men's aphasia group once and in that group, um, the focus was on you know, communication and the individuals talked about what they wanted to talk about, but they also talked about what it was like to be a man and changing roles within their family. So we you know, have, we're heterogeneous individuals and we have you know, different ways that we define ourselves and certainly um, the NAA supports that. And I'm really glad to hear that because I think that sometimes when um, it comes to health, a lot of organizations just focus on the health aspect, but focusing on the social aspect and how it affects us socially, I think is just super important. It's really great to highlight that because uh, people don't just exist within a vacuum and just um, experience this condition by itself. It, it also affects how we interact with the world. So I think that's so amazing. You know, I'm curious to know what are healthcare providers doing now to support people with this condition? Um, yeah, I want to just comment on oh, yeah, so this is so, that's something that you um, I thought of as you were leading into that. There's a philosophy or an approach to aphasia rehabilitation called the life participation approach to aphasia. So yes, we 
educate our patients and we work with our patients as healthcare professionals. My training is as a speech language pathologist and speech language pathologists are the individuals trained to work with people with communication disorders. I specialize with aphasia. Um, and um, while we work with restoring language, we do restorative behavioral treatment approaches as well as compensatory approaches, we also work with participating in life, just like you were alluding to. So um, we not only work sp specifically and directly on language and communication, we work on that in the real world and we really educate people and families about that as well and really work with families in terms of helping them support their loved ones as they are living with aphasia. One thing I always tell my patients is recovery is lifelong. A little bit of a double-edged sword, right? The positive thing is that there is recovery, you know, but the suggestion there is that it takes a long time. Um, but I see that I, I can tend to go at the positive end of that, that it is lifelong and that we are living our lives with aphasia and constantly changing and improving as we move through life. And can you expand on what recovery looks like or what treatment may look like? Sure. So um, often when someone has a non-progressive aphasia, they're just walking around like you and me, regular life, they have a stroke, they end up in the emergency room, they end up in the hospital, they wake up and they can't talk or they're having a lot of difficulty talking. The first time they've ever heard of aphasia, most people, right? Yeah. And so those early days, um, there's a lot going on. You know, they're just, you know, recovering from like the trauma that has happened to them. Um, usually people recover kind of some aspect of their language pretty quickly after that. Um, and then after, you know, the, those first um, acute stages of post-stroke with aphasia are the first three months. And then after three months, we're in the chronic stages. It varies people's recovery in the first um, chronic, in the chronic stage after three months post-stroke. But one, a take-home message that I want to tell you and our listeners here is that recovery occurs after a year post-stroke. People come in and they're so worried about that first year or they're so worried about that first six months that they're thinking like if I don't you know, improve, if I'm not where I want to be, that I'm not going to improve. And that is not true. Research shows that people make gains in the chronic stages one year, two years, more than that post-stroke. So that's important to know that there are gains made. Our treatment sessions, to tell you what we do, we work on um, training specific linguistic tasks, training verbs in different sentence structures, um, really work on exploring the semantic features of words in a pure linguistic task to help people retrieve the words that they're having trouble. Anomia is word finding difficulty. And that is a salient characteristic of all types of aphasia. While there's some specific types of aphasia, word finding difficulty or anomia is a symptom of aphasia that is common in all types of aphasia. So we always work on anomia or word finding. That's amazing. And, and I definitely just want to highlight, you know, how grateful I am that we're, you know, here to have this discussion because this was my first time, you know, hearing about this condition. Um, and so I want to thank you so much for, you know, joining the community and kind of educating us on, you know, um, about, you know, so many people who are living with this condition. So thank you. Thank you. To learn more about the work the association is doing, please visit their website at aphasia.org. Aphasia we have to take a quick break. We'll be back with more open after this.